Welcome to Mr. News Art Class. It's wonderful to see your smiling faces. In our last lesson, we looked at a famous artist named Juan Miro. We saw how he made up his own shapes and his pictures all looked really goofy and silly. Totally not realistic at all. But in today's lesson, we're gonna be doing the opposite. We're gonna be looking at real life and trying to copy the kinds of lines and shapes that we see in the world around us and make our pictures look more realistic. We're gonna do our flowers today in the style of Georgia O'Keeffe. Georgia O'Keeffe was a famous painter who painted ginormous flowers, huge flowers. Unlike most artists who would paint whole gardens, Georgia O'Keeffe painted her flowers one at a time and she made them absolutely huge. This painting in real life is taller than Mr. New. To give you a sense of scale, here's a picture of some of her artwork hanging in a museum. If I make a drawing that's really tiny, I'm not gonna need very much detail, just a simple basic shape. But if I'm making a drawing that huge, then I need to see every last tiny little detail of the object I'm drawing. So let's take a look at what the different parts of a flower are. I'm sure you're all familiar with the flower petals. That's the colorful part that we look at when we think about flowers. And what's under the flower is a stem and maybe some leaves. And then even deeper under the ground, it has roots. But if we take a closer look at the petals where the actual flower is, we see that there's more going on inside the flower than just flower petals. This diagram shows some little stick looking things on the inside in between the flower petals. Those are called the pistil and the stamen. The pistil is the big one in the middle where the flower makes nectar. Nectar is that sweet, juicy liquid that bees and hummingbirds and butterflies like to drink. And then the stamen are the skinnier little sticks that have seeds at the end. The stamen are also where pollen is made. Pollen is that yellow powdery stuff that makes you go achoo, achoo. So here's another one of Georgia O'Keeffe's up close paintings. And notice that in the middle of her flower, she didn't just draw a circle between the flower petals. She drew all those little stamen and the pistil. Before we start our Georgia O'Keeffe inspired flowers, let's see what we're not going to do. What we're not going to do, we're not gonna draw a whole garden and we're not gonna draw a bunch of little bitty flowers. So we're not going to do things like this, where we draw little bitty flowers. We're not gonna draw a whole bunch of them. We're not going to be seeing the stems or the leaves. We are only going to see the flower part and we're going to be zoomed into it where it's nice and up close and in your face. So first things first, we need to decide what color we're going to use. I'm going to have an orange flower. And uh, for step number one, we want to point right in the center of our picture, right in the middle. Not the top, not the side, not the bottom, not the corner. Point right in the middle. And we want a huge circle in the middle. Make it about as big as your fist. You don't need to put your fist down and then trace it, but make it about that big, a nice huge circle. See how that's about as big as my fist? Step number two, just like if you were drawing a little bitty flower, you make these flower petals that are big ovals, right? Now, what I don't want, I don't want little bitty ovals. Like, I don't want them to be this size. Just like I made that circle in the middle bigger, I also want the flower petals to be bigger. So, what I'm going to do is draw this oval flower petal so big it goes all the way to the corner. So big it goes all the way to the edge and keep going like that all the way around so that these flower petals are so big they come all the way to the edges of the page, all the way to the corners, all the way to the edges, like that. For step number three, we need to go back and add more detail. Before we can color this flower in, 
we need to see that since we're zooming in and looking at it up close, we're going to see more detail in the middle. We talked about the pistil and the stamen. Let's start by drawing the pistil, which is going to be right in the middle. And if you imagine that this circle is a bowl, the pistil looks kind of like a spoon. It's big and round on one end, where it goes into the bowl, and then it kind of comes up. And see how that almost looks like a spoon? But then at the top, it's going to have a circle or an oval, and that acts like a little straw where birds, bees, hummingbirds, they can stick their long tongues down in there and lick up the nectar that's inside. Step number four, there is still more detail that needs to be done in the middle here. We need to add the stamen, which are those stick-looking things, those line-looking things that have the seeds at the end. And we're going to just draw those just like that. It's a line with a seed. It's a line with a seed. It's a line with a seed. It's a pattern, right? It's a line and a seed. 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 And you just do enough of those to fill up that whole circle right there. For step number five, it's time to color it in now, and we want to use three different colors. You could use your crayons, but I am going to use paint for this. And, and I want to choose three different colors. One color for the flower petals. The second color is going to be for the middle of the flower. And the third color is going to be for the background, the space behind the flower. Now before I can paint, if I'm using watercolors, I do need some water. So I'm just going to take some water from my bottle here and pour it onto the clear part of the tray. That should be enough right there. Remember that with watercolor paints, you always need a wet brush. So if I just put my brush in the color and then paint, it's not going to do anything, is it? So I need to put my brush in the water. Do I need to like bang it around? No. I just need to gently put it in the water. And then I need to pick a color. I think for my flower, I want to have orange flower petals. So I put my brush in the water. I stir up the orange paint a little bit. And then... I start painting, and when my brush gets dry and it doesn't really do much, do I just go to the color? No, nope, it's not color paint, it's watercolor paint. So I need to put my brush in the water, then the color, and then paint. Should I leave a big puddle right there? No, I should spread that out. And when my brush is dry and it doesn't do anything anymore, where do I put it? That's right, I put it in the water, then the color, and then I paint. Should I leave that puddle there? No, I should spread it out. I want to paint all of the flower petals the same color. It's very tempting to do, like, a lot of times I have kids who say, I'm going to make a rainbow flower, and they want lots of different colors in their flower petals, but then it doesn't look like a flower anymore. Because when we look at flowers in real life, remember this whole project is all about looking and seeing the details of what f real life looks like. And if we look at flowers in real life, do they have lots of different colors of flower petals? I mean, yes, you can see sometimes there are flowers that are red, sometimes there are flowers that are orange, sometimes there are flowers that are yellow. But do they have all of those colors in the same flower? No, no. Flowers do come in lots of different colors, but they don't come where one flower is lots of different colors. So we're going to paint all of our flower petals the same color. We're not going to switch colors until we are done with all of our flower petals. Now I do want to paint the middle of my flower a different color, so I'm not going to paint that orange. I'll wait and I'll paint that a different color after I'm done with my flower petals.
Now, if you were using crayons or markers or something else to color your picture, you just want to make sure that you're not scribbling too quickly. Notice how slowly I'm taking my time with my paints to make sure that I get right up next to the edges without going over the lines. That's an important step, important thing to consider. Okay? All right. When you are done painting all of your flower petals, then it's time to paint the middle. And you want a different color for that. You don't want to use the same color as you did for your flower petals. So I'm going to clean my brush by gently tapping it. I'm not banging it really hard and I'm not trying to stir this water. I'm just gently tapping it. And that kind of cleans the color out of my brush. And then I want to choose what color the middle will be. I think for mine here, I'm going to do yellow in the middle. So I'll get my brush wet. I'll stir up the yellow paint. And I'll paint the middle yellow. Again, just like before, if your brush gets dry, do I go straight to the yellow? No, nope. I go to the water, then the color. And then I paint watercolor paint, right? By having that be a different color, we get a little bit of contrast. Helps that middle part of the flower to stand out. Makes it easier to see the different parts of the flower, doesn't it? And when you are done coloring the middle part of your flower, you can pick your third color for the background. All of this empty space, we want to paint all the way to the edges of the page. So I'm going to pick a third color here. I guess for mine, maybe I will do blue. Before I switch colors, I need to wash my brush. I'm gently tapping it to get the yellow color out of my brush. And then I'm going to get my brush wet. I'm going to put it in the blue. Stir that blue up a little bit. And then I'll paint the background blue. Now, when you're painting the background or coloring in the background, does it have to be blue? No. Um, a lot of times people say, yeah, it has to be blue because it's the blue sky, right? Except you could paint it green like you're seeing trees and stuff behind it. Or you could paint it red like you're seeing red trees behind it, you know, like if it's in the fall time. Or you don't even have to think about the background in terms of what would really in real life be behind it. Because, you know, sometimes people take flowers inside, right? You might take a flower and put it in a vase inside and there might be a black wall behind it, right? So there could be anything behind it. It doesn't have to be the blue sky or green trees or whatever. It can be any color for the background. But try to choose something that contrasts, something that's different from the colors you've already used so that it makes it really, really pop out. I chose blue because it's opposite from orange on the color wheel. Blue and orange really, really make a lot of contrast. But do you have to do your flower orange and your background blue? No. You can do any colors you want.
And there you have it. I'm finished. Notice that I didn't leave any space white. I painted all the way to the edges of my picture and um, made sure that my flower was completely painted in. And I have my beautiful Georgia O'Keeffe inspired flower painting, ginormous, huge flower painting. Now, before I close my paint tray, I need to wash my brush. I need to put my brush in here and I need to wipe that up before I close it. So I'm just gonna take a paper towel and wipe this up. Do I need to wipe the colors? No, I, I can leave those alone. They are a little bit wet. The colors that I used, like the orange, the yellow, and the blue are a little bit wet. But really what I need to do is just get that water up out of the lid of the tray so that I don't spill a bunch of water all over the place. And then I can just close that and I'm good to go. Now, I don't have any big puddles of water that would drippy droop if I hang this up, so I could hang this up to dry, or I could lay it flat, either way. But I don't wanna go stick this in my backpack with all this wet paint on it. I wanna let that dry before I take it home. In today's lesson, we learned how to closely analyze what we're looking at so that we can more accurately draw the things we see in real life. In the next lesson, we'll talk about artists who use their community and their environment as an inspiration for their art. I can't wait to see you then.